I'm Shankar Vedantam, host of the podcast Hidden Brain. Do you ever feel like you and a friend are speaking past each other? Or that you're not sure how to break out of a rut? We explore questions that keep you up at night and provide answers that are grounded in rigorous science. Join us each week to explore your hidden brain. Hello, I'm Chris Anderson. Welcome to The TED Interview. This is the podcast series where I get to sit down with a single TED speaker and discuss their ideas in greater depth. Now then, today I get to talk with Elif Shafak. Elif is a celebrated novelist, political scientist, and essayist. She's Turkish, but has lived in many parts of the world, currently living in London, where she writes regular columns for The Guardian, commenting on a wide range of topics, global politics, issues around identity, issues around storytelling. And this breadth of experiences and interests makes Elif just an absolutely wonderful conversation partner. Elif believes that many of the problems facing our world today have come about because of a tendency to oversimplify complex realities. I think our world is full of unprecedented challenges. Because wherever I look, I see nuances withering away. On TV shows, we have one anti-something speaker situated against a pro-something speaker. Yeah, it's good ratings. It's even better if they shout at each other. Even in academia, where our intellect is supposed to be nourished, you see one atheist scholar competing with a firmly theist scholar, but it's not a real intellectual exchange because it's a clash between two certainties. In my conversation with Elif, we'll pick apart this idea of certainty and take on a whole range of topics, trying to make sense of the turbulent times we live in. Let's see where this goes. Elif, welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I think we should start by you telling some of your story. Tell us about how you grew up and how that shaped who you are. Well, I, I, when I look back, I realize there have been so many journeys. Life itself is a journey. That's I, I really believe in that. But in particular, in my case, Maybe it was a very nomadic existence because I was born in France, in Strasbourg, to Turkish parents. Um, my father was, he was an academic. He was pursuing his PhD in philosophy in Strasbourg. But shortly afterwards, their marriage collapsed and my father stayed in France. My mother took me to Ankara, Turkey, the, the capital of Turkey. And of course, for her, Ankara or Turkey, this was the motherland. Whereas for me, as a toddler, as a child, it was a new country that I had to discover almost from scratch. And in this state, we arrived in the neighborhood of my grandmother, which was a very conservative, very patriarchal neighborhood. And from then on, I was raised by two women. And these women were very different, my mother and my grandmother. Um, but I must also tell you, when my mom got divorced and brought me back to Turkey, she was very, very young. And because she had dropped out of university, she had no diploma, no career, no money, nothing to fall back on. And usually women in such situations, they are immediately married off to someone older. But it was my Eastern traditional grandmother who intervened and said, no, my daughter should go back to university. She should graduate she should have a career, she should have choices in life. If she wants to get married again, she can always do it. So um, when people said, but she can't do that because she has a child to take care of, my grandmother said, I will raise my granddaughter until the day her mother is ready to come and get her. So I, you know, I was raised in a very unusual setting. I did not grow up in a, in a traditional Turkish family. My mom did graduate with actually very high average and then she became a diplomat and afterwards she and I traveled a lot. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because my grandmother's intervention uh, and her support for women's education changed not only my mother's life, but also mine and most probably my children's as well. So the impact of solidarity between women, I think, goes on for generations. Well, I, th I think as, as you've described, your grandmother and mother were in many ways like hugely different, and yeah. they and they fed different 
things to you. I mean, what you just said about your grandmother in some ways is surprising because you've described her elsewhere as, you know, very conservative, um, full of superstition. T- tell us a bit more about the difference between them. Well, um, maybe I wouldn't call her conservative, but she was traditional. Um, she was very spiritual, very irrational, you know, remarkably irrational, but at the same time, surprisingly wise. And perhaps from her, I got my love for oral culture and oral storytelling. She was a storyteller. To me, it's interesting because from my mother, I got almost the opposite, my love for written culture. My mom is very westernized, very modern, secular, urban, rational, and grandma was pretty much the opposite. You know, she would, she was a healer. She would be like melting lead to ward off the evil eye. She would be reading coffee cups. People would come to her. And it was a universe in which people talked about jinni as if it were like they were real creatures. You know, you could talk about invisible aspects of life. It was just full of magic. The, the skeptical bones in my body, you know, when someone says, oh, they're a healer, I go, no, that can't happen. Talk, talk to me more about that. What I have seen as a child observing my grandmother heal, quote unquote, in a limited way. This could be psychological. It could be because people believed in that. Um, we can explain it in many different ways. But I have seen how people supported each other by using traditions, herbs, um, centuries of culture that sometimes we look down upon, and I find that wrong too. Mm. There's a wisdom there that is transferred from one generation to the next. And I think we should also be tuned into that world, try to see what's the best in it. This is not an alternative to science, of course not. But to be aware of, the, of that wisdom, I think, is, is, a, is good for our own cognitive flexibility. Now, fast forward, I myself, I'm not a believer. I have too much doubt to be a believer. And I don't like certainty. So my problem with many people who are very religious is that they want to get rid of doubt. But equally, people who are very confident of their atheism, they want to get rid of faith. Whereas for me, what is much more interesting is the dance of faith and doubt. We learn from both faith and doubt. Why separate them so much? Mm. Um, Overall, what I believe in sincerely is I think faith is way too important to leave to the religious And patriotism is way too important to leave it to the nationalists, you know, just like the tech world is way too important to leave to tech monopolies (laughs) and politics is way too important to leave to politicians. So in all these fields, we can become more engaged citizens. And particularly, I believe liberals and progressives need to rethink these fields of patriotism and faith. Okay, wow. Well, you've raised so many things there. And I hope we're going to come to all of them. But I mean, to talk a bit about just the power of storytelling, like so much of your work, it's rather than making specific accusations against people, you tell stories that just Mm -hmm. reveal a different way Mm -hmm. of looking at the world that is that is richer, where where if there is injustice, you you feel it. Mm -hmm. Um, How could we all do a better job of replacing some of the political, the angry, outrage provoking too far that we have with an attempt to understand better and to, and to perhaps to tell stories in a different way. I'm a, I'm a storyteller and maybe I'm a commuter like James Baldwin used to you know, describe himself. And when, I, when you are a commuter, you become a listener. I listen to people a lot and I listen to two things, what they're saying, but also how they're saying what they're saying, with what kind of energy. And if I... Uh, can share this with you. I have many readers in Turkey who are very, very xenophobic, you know, and who Mm. are very homophobic. So when you ask their opinions about minorities, particularly about Jews, Armenians, Greeks, uh, Kurds, because these are the main minorities in Turkey, they will tell you lots of biased things because this is the only narrative they've heard. Similarly, I have many readers who are very homophobic. Again, they're very biased against sexual minorities. But then they come and they say, you know, I've read your book. And this is the character that I love the most. Or why did you make this, this, this fictional character cry? You know, I loved him so much. And maybe the characters they're talking about are, Arme- are Armenian or Greek or Jewish or sexual minorities. So I thought about this a lot. You know, how is it that people who are more 
judgmental, intolerant in the public space, when they are reading a novel, they mm. become a little bit more open-minded, a little bit ready to connect with the other. I don't think that's a coincidence. All kinds of authoritarian regimes and narratives require collectivistic identity and erasing individuality. Fascism requires synchronized energy of masses, crowds, chanting. What the art of the novel storytelling does is to restore our individuality, not in a selfish way, but in such a way that we can connect with the with the rest of the humanity and realize that, wait a minute, maybe the person I have always thought as the other, maybe he or she is not that different than me. Mm. You know, to me, that individual space that the novel nurtures is very important to break this um, clashes that we are we're going through right now. So I really honestly think storytellers need to speak up more in in today's world. Well, I, I don't think anyone could read one of your novels without getting a clearer empathy for, you know, quote the other. And that tradition is, I guess, is what novels have done. You could argue that novels in general played a huge role in persuading people just to think bigger and to, you know, to imagine the possibility of a, of a connected world. Um, it seems like, like right at the heart of it is there are, I think, two sort of fundamental ways of thinking about the world. A lot of people think that, you know, the world is a certain way. There is a truth out there. There is a reality out there. You know, there's a God who created the world and he wrote this book and this is the way we do it. Or there is no God out there. There is only science and our lives are fundamentally meaningless and that is the truth and we have to accept it. Um, other people delight in the uncomfortableness of not knowing and accepting that everyone may have, quote, their own truth. In some ways, the phrase to me, you know, you may have your own truth, that is almost a contradiction in terms. That is giving up on the possibility that there is one one truth. Like that, there could be different ways of expressing the truth or understanding the truth. But truth, by definition, wants to be one thing, even if we see it differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand. And actually, I find this conversation so important and so timely, isn't it? When I was very young, I read a novel I've never forgotten called The Bridge Over the Drina. I was a high school student. And until then, I had swallowed the nationalist education in Turkey, which told me that we were a great empire, the Ottoman Empire, and we brought justice and civilization wherever we went. So that is my interpretation of history until then. And I'm reading this novel, and there's a moment when two peasants in the Balkans, they're talking about the Janissary system in the Ottoman Empire, which was the, the military system. Mm. Christian children were taken into the Janissary system and they formed the army of the Ottoman Empire. So one of the peasants says, thanks to the Janissary system, our poor children were given a good education. They were able to go all the way up the ladder and they became even viziers. The other one says, are you sure it was so painful because our children were taken away from us without our consent. They were converted to Islam without their consent. They were asked to erase their identity, forget their religion, their language. They never saw their mothers. They never saw their families again. So yes, they were given an education, but at the expense of what? And then all of a sudden, me as a young Turkish student, I just froze. It had never occurred to me that the history that was taught to me top down could be seen in different ways, depending on who was telling the story. And as a novelist, to me, this is very important because when you ask the question, how would I feel had I been a concubine in the harem, an Armenian silversmith, a Jewish miller? You know, how was the life of a prostitute who was forced to accompany the army? Just boil it down to these micro questions. Try to see the story through the eyes of individuals, mm -hmm. particularly the minorities whose voices have been erased. And then you realize, wait a minute, there is no such thing as absolute history and I need to pay attention to the stories of the others. That mm. is what I'm defending. That's a beautiful anecdote and reflects the same kind of arguments that there are about colonialism. You know, as a Brit, I was, the main narrative I heard was, um, for all its faults, colonialism brought a lot of great things to, to the world. Legal systems, roads, yeah. trains, yeah. marvelous. Um, and then you hear other much darker stories of colonialism from people who were devastated by it. And 
probably neither of those individual narratives mm -hmm. is enough to truly understand the world. And somehow mm -hmm. we have to embrace both. And people are really bad at embracing multiple stories. Yes, people often behave as if they have to choose just one narrative and stick to it no matter what. You know, even institutions that were so painful might have had some positive impacts for some people. It is okay to be able to talk about these things. However, I think for me, it's much more crucial to give more voice to the stories of the silenced, yes. you know, because those are the stories that we never hear, particularly in non-democracies. And this has been a huge feature of so much of your work, yeah. and it sometimes got you into trouble. It did indeed, yeah. <laughs> talk, talk about the publication of The Bastard of Istanbul. Well, um, The Bastard of Istanbul is a novel that tells the story of a Turkish family and an Armenian-American family, generations of women. So most of the story is told through the eyes of women. Um, and it's a story that deals with memory and amnesia. I think we in Turkey, even though we have a very rich history, old history, we are a society of collective amnesia. You know, our connection with the past is full of ruptures. So in a nutshell, this is a novel that dares to talk about the Armenian genocide. And uh, after the book was published, I was put on trial under Article 301, which is supposed to protect Turkishness against insults, but nobody knows what that means. So I was accused of insulting Turkishness. And what they did was to take out sentences from the novel. And as a result, my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters in the courtroom. It was very surreal. On the one side, it was dark. There were like mobs, groups on the streets, ultranationalist groups spitting at my pictures because they thought I was the, like, the pawn of Western powers. Even after I was acquitted, after a year, I had to live with a bodyguard for a year and a half. Yeah, but at the terrifying. same yeah. but at the same time I think I need to mention that the book was widely read shared and it it the whole experience taught me the importance of the energy that comes from readers I sincerely believe in countries where there is no proper freedom of speech if novels survive if the publishing industry continues to work and exist we mostly owe it to readers. Because in a country like Turkey, a book is not a personal item. You read it. If you like it, you pass it on. Mm. And people would come to me having underlined sentences with different colored pens because different people have read the same copy. So that word of mouth, that sharing is incredibly precious and heartwarming. But on the other hand, the lack of freedom of speech, of course, is quite dark. I think when you, when you share something absent the context... It can enrage people. I mean, these were yeah. quotes from characters in a novel. Yeah. They weren't your advice to yeah. every Turkish citizen or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's it's this was a, a work of fiction. And even in um, the world's holy books, this feels to me like a big issue. Like if you if you see certain words in a scripture, yeah. if you say that is God telling me to behave in a certain way, for example, to exact revenge on someone. Mm -hmm. um, that will lead you to do one thing. If you say, no, this, these were words written at a particular time in a particular context, yeah. then you take a completely different lesson from them. And we're, and we're incredibly bad at sort of separating those two things. And, and people want simplicity. They want, they, they yeah. want we're, we're just very, very bad at handling nuance. I, I, I so agree. People want simplicity. And I think the more complex it feels, the age we're living in, it's full of uncertainties, the more perhaps some people's need for simplicity and this is a very dangerous crossroads because this is exactly where the demagogue enters the picture. Mm. Um, so we have demagogues, East and West, telling us that actually things are very simple, that Brexit is going to be very simple, you know, that trade deals are going to be very simple, that actually everything is very simple and they are going to provide that simplicity. That is very, very dangerous. It is an illusion. The demagogues also tell us that if we are surrounded by sameness, we will be safer. If we retreat into our tribes, we will be safer. That is a lie. Whether we like it or not, we're all far too interconnected to think that by building up walls and retreating into tribes, we will uh, stay away from the problems of others. So to me, it makes more sense to work together as world citizens, as global souls, mm -hmm. rather than retreat into tribes. So, so let's talk more about this, because this is really important. I mean, first of all, give your sort of diagnosis of what happened because these demagogues didn't arise by accident. There was ground 
was prepared in a sense. They were tapping into very deep emotions, very understandable emotions. What, what went wrong? To be honest, it pisses me off so much to see how populist demagogues are much better at addressing people's emotions than many people on the left, uh, many liberals, you know, who speak more with reason, with data. But I think we need to understand the power of emotions. And we live in an age in which lots of negative emotions guide and misguide politics, including anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety. There's anger. There's fear. There's resentment and bitterness. So here's where I make a distinction. I think many people have many understandable, legitimate concerns and anxieties. We cannot just brush that aside. But unfortunately, the populist elite, and I'm using the phrase populist elite very deliberately, and I think we should use it over and over because they like to present themselves as if they're not part of the elite, but they are. And I think populists have no problem with the elite as long as they are the elite. So I use that phrase very deliberately. What the populist elite does is to exploit those concerns, those emotions for their own ends, for their own benefits. So we should be very critical of the populist elite, but at the same time, understand the reasons why people have those concerns because populism is not the the reason why we're going through this it is a symptom but it's also a catalyst it turns people into something much much nastier mm. but the reason why some of those emotions are there um, you could probably lay at the door of the liberal progressive elites in a way. I think arguably we weren't paying attention to a lot of things. We stirred up emotion both through economic policy, if you like, you know, globalism at all costs, for example, um, technology at all costs, for example, but also through the language that that we deploy. Like the, the, some, of, some of the language around progress, around political identity, around identity politics in general seems to have become anathema to people where they, they feel, I am scared of these progressive elites. They're no longer addressing me. They're taking away a life I'm familiar with. And, and it arguably made it much easier to whip up anger about, you know, invasion of my community by outsiders, etc. Does that make any sense? It does make a lot of sense. And I think the main divide right now is actually not between left and right. At the heart of everything lies inequality. It is the year 2019 and I think we need to make inequality the center, the front of all our discussions. Of course, primarily economic inequality. You know, it is just unthinkable, ununderstandable. Uh, it's not possible to defend this growing inequality that, that has become worse and worse. But there's also some cultural gaps, epistemic gaps, and of course, educational inequality that we need to talk about. Many people, in my opinion, rightly feel feel like the politicians all together, whatever party they belong in, they're just so far away from their realities. People do have concerns about whether their children will have the same opportunities for education or the job market. And I think these are understandable worries. And I am a foreigner myself, you know, I am, I, I am an immigrant myself, but I do understand that some people have worries about cultural diversity. So I need to find a new narrative, a new language that can communicate with people who don't necessarily think like I do. If I can't do that, I will be pushing them towards the lap of the far right, where unfortunately they're saying, you know what, you can voice all your concerns here, we won't judge you. So we need to be very careful, we need to go beyond our chambers. Mm. And the answer to one type of tribe is not to retreat into another tribe and think that's progressive. I think that's a very regressive approach. What we need to do is go beyond tribes. So let's isolate the populist elites, but let's connect with the people. It is ironic and in, in a way heartbreaking that the places where most outsiders actually live in a country, namely the cities, are the places where people are least worried about immigration and yeah. <laughs> diversity. Like they, they actually, when um, in most of, in many, many cities, people of all races celebrate that, that global diversity and they, they get a lot of joy from it, whether it's food, whether it's culture, whether it's just friendships. And um, you almost wish you could say, you know, Actually, when you when when you give <laughs> when you give multiculturalism a chance, it really works. It's it's kind of fun. It's cool. It, like life gets more interesting. And the people who are most fearful of immigration often live with fewest 
immigrants actually nearby. It's it's it's, it's a paradox there. That no? is that is very true. I mean, as you said, in countries, in regions where there is diversity, actually people's perceptions of multiculturalism is much more positive. But overall, what I can tell you is I come from a country that has lost its diversity, that has lost its cosmopolitan past. And I think by losing this in Turkey, our loss has been enormous. And I'm not talking about a political loss or a, or a you know economic loss only, but something in our conscience was gone. Diversity matters. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is our duty, in my opinion, to make it work. The other is a very dangerous tunnel, and we have enough experience and enough knowledge of history to know yeah. where that tunnel takes us. And if, I, I would like you to explain how you align what you just said, which is, you know, we, we need a lot more diversity, with some of what you've said about identity politics, where you've, you've expressed concern at identity politics and how, how that plays out. Yes, it really matters to me a lot. I've always been very critical of identity politics, and I do not think it's a progressive way of thinking at all. It might be where we start, but it can't be where we end up. So we need to move beyond identity politics. All extremist ideologies, let us not forget, are trying to narrow us down into a singular monolithic identity. And we need to be aware of that. I look at myself, of course, I'm an Istanbulite. I'm very attached to Istanbul. And I think I carry the city with me, you know, wherever you go. Like the Greek poet Kavafis said, the city follows you wherever you go. But at the same time, I'm attached to the Balkans, the Aegean. Um, there are so many elements in my soul that I bring from the Middle East. They will always be with me. Yet at the same time, I'm a European by birth, by choice, the values that I share. I've become a Londoner over the years, then a British citizen. And despite what Theresa May claims, I would like to think of myself as a citizen of the world and as a global soul. So why can't I have multiple belongings? Why do I have to be reduced to a single thread? I think... We have, even in feminist uh, circles, more liberal progressive circles, we are losing the emphasis on multiplicity. And that worries me. This wasn't the case always. For instance, when you read someone like Audre Lorde, she matters to me a lot. Audre Lorde, she says, you know, look at me. I'm a woman. I'm a poet. I'm black. I'm, I'm, I'm lesbian. I'm this. I'm that. I'm many more things. I contain multitudes, like Walt Whitman mm. used to say. We lost that thread. Now you have to choose your, your tribe. And, and and that is not a progressive approach at all. So, so if, tell me if I have this right. Like, I, I think of identity politics as the belief that the most important political questions of the moment can be looked at as the need to address longstanding power imbalances, oppression, if you like, of, of specific groups. And that if you don't pay attention to that, you are missing the main game in town. And I think some people would say that you can actually have multiple identities and still be passionate about identity politics. The word intersectionality seems to be about that, that you can both be passionate about racial injustice and gender injustice, etc. But the core of it is that this is the main political issue and to solve it, you have to address oppression, long-standing historic oppression. And so that, that would be the argument... For, mm -hmm. But if the political question becomes one about writing oppression, that feels like a sort of a one-dimensional push-pull. And maybe that, that is essential, but part of me says, but what about reframing these questions about what two different sides can actually build together? Because if it's about addressing oppression full stop, it's hard to see how the sides ever come together, because that is partly why, mm -hmm. arguably, mm -hmm. a whole group of people, for example, in the middle of America or in rural Britain, mm -hmm. have felt that their own identity is being threatened by the future that they're hearing about from the elites. Absolutely. Identity politics can make us very passionate about single causes. To me, there isn't a single issue in life. And actually, there are multiple issues. And as human beings, our minds and our hearts are vast enough to 
comprehend and to work for all these issues simultaneously. I don't have to choose, pick just one single cause and then, you know, defend that all my life. I can speak about multiple things. So we can think about expanding our, our approach rather than narrowing it down. But just to give you one example, because I don't want it to be too abstract, when I look at the women's movement, I find it very important that feminism turns into global feminism, global sisterhood. Even that is not enough. So it has to go beyond cultures, beyond divisions of West versus East. We need to have a very honest conversation about the hierarchies and the gaps within the feminist movement. You know, where do we where do we need to have more bridges between cultures? And then beyond that, we need to reach out and talk about masculinity and work with men together. Because I think patriarchy at the end of the day, of course it makes women unhappy, but it also makes men unhappy. If I cannot understand how masculinity becomes a straight jacket, particularly imposed on young men, you know, limiting them, limiting their freedoms, I'm not doing a good enough job. So the kind of women's movement that is embracing, that goes hand in hand with LGBT movement, but also reaches out and talks honestly about the construction of masculinity. So that is a more nuanced approach in which more people can feel on board and they can be um, part of this movement together. To me, it's very important to talk about inclusiveness. Okay, so you're a woman, I'm a man. Mm -hmm. Talk to me more about patriarchy in a way that is inclusive. Some men hear the term patriarchy and they think that they are being accused of signing up for some secret society where they secretly control all the, the, the hidden levers of power. And some men go, wait a sec, I, I never got the memo. I never went to that meeting. What, what, what are you talking about? I love women. Uh, don't, don't make me feel so guilty. And they, they, they respond badly. So, so help educate me as to how I should think of patriarchy. Like what, what's the language that leads men and women to come together to, to, to fix this? I think we should we should discover this together, you know, rather than one group telling the other group how they should be thinking. I don't like um, maybe top-down approaches at all. To me, civil society is important and diversity within civil society, within the public space is very important. That said, you know, when we talk about racism, of course I'm going to listen to, you know, a writer of, of color because his or her experiences might be different than mine mm. you know we're going to listen to each other's experiences and for that we need to have an open mind what i'm trying to say is it is very complex rather than thinking of patriarchy as something that men do to women we need to think of it as a layered as a complex system in which men and women are not free no no none of us is free actually and it's based on inequality one of my novels is called Honor, and I wrote about the, the concept of honor, which can be very imposing, very dominant, especially all over the Middle East. And one of the issues that I addressed, even though it was hard, was how we as mothers raise our sons, sometimes as the little sultans in the family. And these boys grow up thinking they have a responsibility to keep an eye on the modesty of their sisters and, and mothers. I, ha I did a lot of research on honor killings in Turkey. And in some cases, it was very sad to see how the matriarchs in the family had encouraged these boys, like 15-year-old, 16-year-old boys, to commit these crimes. So I'm trying to say it's far more complex than we realize. Mm. Mm. Of course, patriarchy thrives on injustice. Mm. 
But we need to understand its layers. That consciousness is the beginning to start questioning things. Why is it like that? You know, why are women receiving less less wages when they do the same kind of job? Why is it that they're telling me it is natural for a woman to be a mother primarily? You know, this is the narrative that I hear in my in my country. Um, why is it that in politics there are so few women? So asking these questions together is an important mm. part of this journey. And if I may add this, you know, we talked about populism, the rise of nationalism, tribalism, a backlash against progressive reforms that were done in the name of, you know, um, gender equality. There is a big backlash against that. We need to be very much aware of this. It is happening in country after country. Lately, it happened in Spain with the Vox Party in Andalusia. One of their main narratives is that, you know, women have gone too far and we need to protect the traditional family. So there is a backlash. And to me, this is very important because for such a long time, people in the West assumed that you were beyond the threshold. You already mm. had achieved democracy. But all I'm saying is even the rights that you enjoy, you might lose them because things can go backwards. I thought one thing that you said there in your explanation of patriarchy that is powerful, I mean, listening as a man, is saying, you know, I'm not saying that this is something that men decide to do to women. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there's a system that for whatever historical and cultural reasons, it happens that that system tends to create unfair outcomes for, for women. And by the way, that's no fun for anyone. That, that, yeah. that means that we all lose. And I, and I think explain that way, every modern, <laughs> every reasonable man is, is 100% on board. Um, I mean, you're, you're so powerful on language. Talk a bit more about the kind of language that you would like to be edited if you like, L language that's coming out of the progressive side. Mm -hmm. Well, one mistake we're making is we often say to ourselves, we should go out and explain it to people. Uh, that is the wrong approach because it, it, it sounds as if we know all the answers and we're going to you know, convey those answers. No, we don't know all the answers. Um, what we're going through extraordinary times and I am afraid to say that the movements that we're seeing right now, you know, this populist, isolationist, tribalist trend, it is only the beginning. I think this is going to go on for quite some time. So we need to understand how we're going to deal with this problem. It is, it is a problem. History can go backwards. It doesn't always go forward. In Freedom House, they um, published their report for 2017, at the first glance, it seemed good news. 35 countries had made progress. And then the next line says 71 countries, twice as many, had been going backwards with a bewildering speed. And one of those countries, for sure, is my motherland, Turkey. So all I'm saying is democracy is far more fragile than we assumed. It is a delicate ecosystem. When we think about ourselves, we always think about our rights, but we need to talk about our duties as well as citizens of this world. You know, how do I become more engaged in the civic space? And when I say civic space, I also mean the digital space. Mm. What can I do? We have to become more alert citizens, more aware citizens. And I think we, ha we need to become more politicized, all mm. of us. I don't think any of us has the luxury of being non-political in this age. It is very important that the change, the energy, the impetus comes from us citizens from the civil society um, because there's a lot at stake and I really think we can go backwards and democracies can die. You used a phrase there t twice now, citizen of, of the world, and another phrase, global soul. These are labels where I, I feel really close connection with you. <laughs> we, um, yeah, um, you know, you, you went to a school in Spain with mm -hmm kids from many countries. I went to a school in India with kids from many countries. Yeah. Your, your whole life is that of mm -hmm. a citizen of many places and of humanity overall. And this idea that we were on a journey, perhaps all of humanity was on a journey to gradually mm -hmm. letting go of some of the older tribal identities and reprioritizing identities that mm -hmm. are broader and encompass more people. Mm -hmm. That felt like that was the trajectory that we were on and that, you know, Media could help, technology could help, travel could help. Um, there's something beautiful about thinking of yourself as a citizen of the world. And yet, here we are, suddenly that very notion has become 
demonized by populists in many ways, that people have been frightened of it. And I, I'm curious as to whether you see any way ahead to reclaim that idea and somehow to frame it in a way where it is inspiring and hopeful and encompassing mm -hmm. and, and not terrifying. Yes, I, 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 I hear everything you're saying and really resonates with me. Um, you will remember in 2000s, early 2000s, late 1990s, there was so much optimism. And there was complacency as well. There was arrogance as well, to be honest. And people who at the time thought that Western liberal systems were the only systems that could survive because at the end of the day, Uh, the Berlin Wall had come down, the Soviet Union was no more. So it seemed like the triumph, a big triumph for liberal democracy. And people who defended that view actually saw history in a linear way, as if, you know, we could all go in only one direction. And that meant countries that are not progressive enough or developed or democratic enough right now, one day, sooner or later, they will have to catch up with the rest of the Western world. It could only go in one way. And that was very wrong. That approach, actually people who defended that, they didn't see themselves as citizens of the world. They thought they came from a superior civilization. Mm. And that is wrong. We now know, actually, there's no such thing as solid countries versus liquid countries. We're all living in liquid times, as the late Sigmund Baumann told us. That was the, the subject of your last TED Talk, which the, was it's such a beautiful talk. phrase, yeah. that we're living in liquid times. Yeah. Just, just a couple more words on what you actually mean by that. Well, until recently, I, I even think until 2016, um, many people, with all the good intentions, they assumed that some parts of the world were much more turbulent, liquid lands, uh, Turkey definitely being one of them. And it was in those places that you needed to work hard for gender equality, for democracy, for freedom of speech, human rights. But then some other parts of the world, namely the West, were regarded as safe, solid. You know, you didn't really need to worry about democracy or rule of law because it was already established. So all I'm saying is after the year 2016, this dualistic view of the world has been shattered to pieces. And I think right now more and more people realize even the rights that they had taken for granted could disappear one day, you mm. know, and actually we're all living in a time of uncertainties. We're all living in liquid times. Liquid times, turbulent times. Turbulent times, mm. indeed. Yeah. You know, the, the idea of being a citizen of the world, of global citizenship, if I roll the clock back 10 years, there was a theory of the world sort of relentlessly moving outward that as we got to know and identify and see mm -hmm. more people around the world, our circle of empathy expanded, the borderline between us and them was getting bigger. And there seemed no reason to believe that that, that could extend indefinitely and that fundamentally we'd, we'd all look around and go, you know what, we're all humans. And we, by the way, we face extraordinary external threats, all of us. Mm -hmm. The climate is changing. Nuclear war could kill us all. There might be an incoming asteroid. There might be a global pandemic. We need to dial up this identity or we will face doom because if we're in these squabbling tribes, we just can't address the global threats facing us. That was certainly my whole worldview and it's, and it's made it shocking and horrifying to see the massive move backward in that regard. So you, Alif, uh, you have the language and the the soul <laughs> to do something about this. I, like I hear it in how you speak and in your writing. How what, what's What's the path by which we could get people to want that identity to be a bigger part of who they are? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm a political scientist by training, and one of the things that always saddened me is to see this extreme emphasis, particularly in political science, on data, measurable quantitative data, which is, of course, very important. Research is extremely important. I'm by no means underestimating that. But there are other things in life that might not be that easy to measure, and yet they matter just as much. So my worry is many analysts have not paid enough attention to culture. And what we're experiencing right now is primarily a clash in the field of culture, which breaks my heart because to me, culture is a unifying force. You know, it, it brings people together. It is a bridge, but it can also be 
divisive if, if, if it's exploited, if it's misinterpreted. So for people who are in the world of culture, as storytellers, artists, people who care about culture, it's very important to speak up right now and, and try to bridge those gaps. Language, to me, matters. So one of the things I question a lot is these binary oppositions that we are being constantly subjected to. We need to be very careful about this. Because this is how tribalism starts. They're telling us that there are only two ways. You're either completely pro-open borders, let anyone you want come in, you know, or you want safety and security, so choose your side. We have the right to say, you know what, I don't believe in your artificial duality. I think as a human being, I have more choices. I can be pro-immigration and at the same time defend a sensible immigration policy. I'm not going to choose any part of this artificial duality that you're imposing on us. The clash between the two cultures that you're talking about is is basically the, the clash between ha, what would you use, use the labels sort of nationalists mm -hmm. versus what progressives or sort of urban globalists. How would you label what you think is the, the sharpest culture clash of the moment? Well, several things are taking place um, at the same time. It worries me a lot to see how the tech world is unfortunately changing. Again, you know, speaking about the optimism of early 2000s, I think the biggest optimists at the time were the tech optimists. So much so that, especially in my part of the world, they thought, you know, thanks to digital technology, the entire Middle East was going to become one happy democracy. The yeah. uprisings in Iran were labeled as Twitter Uh, revolution. And people thought, well, the youth in Iran are now firing tweets against autocracy. You will remember in Egypt, uh, particularly the Arab Spring, so much so that a young couple in, in Egypt named their newborn baby daughter Facebook. So as we're speaking right now, there's a teenager in Egypt named Facebook whose very presence symbolizes the optimism of the time. <laughs> you, um, you, you wish you could see some of those dinner conversations. Mom, dad... Facebook? Facebook. Really? Yeah, exactly. I've got that for life. Exactly. <laughs> maybe, Now, maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be another twist in the story, and in three yeah. years' time, we'll all be singing Facebook's praises again. Well, you never know. I, I think um, Facebook, in particular, but the digital world in general, social media in general, is a bit like the moon. It definitely has a bright side in terms of connecting us, you know, letting ideas travel freely. So, by no means, I'm underestimating that. However, because we have only focused on the bright side, We forgot to see its dark side. And today is the time we need to be very aware, alert about the dark side of social media. The idea was each and every one of us was going to have an equal voice. That is mm. not what's happening on social media. People on the fringes who used to stay on the fringes, more racist, nationalist, sexist, their voices through algorithms are now affecting and dominating the mainstream. We can't be naive about this. So to me, it's very important to be aware of the dark side of social media and ask the tech companies to be more responsible. Mm. Uh, you can't just say, you know, we're just free publishing platforms, they're more than that. Well, indeed. I mean, there's been a massive mood shift. I mean, TED is probably one of the homes of yeah. techno-optimism, yeah. um, certainly a decade ago. Um, in the last couple of years, the mood has shifted spectacularly. At the last TED this year, the level of anger at some of the social media companies was palpable and the mood has changed. You've got, you've got interesting way of thinking about... Um, information that I'd, I'd like you to articulate like you've, you've differentiated between information knowledge yeah. and wisdom could you could you share yeah. that yes i think they're completely separate things and sometimes we use them interchangeably but they aren't same thing so we do live in an age in which we have a lot of information obviously but also a lot of misinformation which we need to be careful about. And we tend to think that if you have enough information about a subject, you do know that subject. Actually, it is the opposite. I think the more information we have about a particular subject, sometimes the less we know. Um, because well, What it, does it mean to know a subject then? Because... Um, Even if you don't have much information about a very niche subject, you can Google it, right? In, in five seconds, in five minutes, you can have enough, enough information. And that might lead us into thinking, okay, I have enough knowledge about this particular subject. But knowledge is different. Knowledge primarily requires us to slow down. 
You can't rush knowledge. And to look more deeply, it's more in-depth analysis, you know, to, to notice the nuances. And then there's wisdom, which is something completely different and to me is very important because I think wisdom combines knowledge with emotional intelligence, with empathy and stories. So mm. wisdom comes from the heart and the mind simultaneously. It's a combination of different styles. And to me, one of the important things is how can we encourage more wisdom and lessen this emphasis on information because we have... It's, there's a fetishism almost about, you know, how important information is. We think that's enough. So But can I, can I play that isn't. back to you and see if I've got that right? So, so in the pursuit of knowledge, yeah. beware of just gorging on too much information yeah. that may deceive you into thinking you know more than you do, yeah. that the true knowledge comes not from quantity of information, but from subtlety of it from from exploring something from all angles from being willing for example to listen to naysayers or skeptics or the hidden voices around a topic yeah. not just taking an ever you know growing amount of sort of surface information absolutely absolutely and then wisdom you take that knowledge and you um listen reshape it Yeah. with your emotions with mm. your with your heart and that changes the language that that changes the style do you have any any recent story that you can think of where you saw real wisdom mm. in action yes i think um how the prime minister in new zealand responded to the christchurch terrorist attacks was incredible you know and it was an act of wisdom There was knowledge there, there was research there, there was understanding the problem, but also she spoke with her heart. She connected with people. She, she wasn't afraid to show her emotions. This is very important because unfortunately, particularly female politicians, because there are so few and because they have to prove or many think that they have to prove how tough they are, they tend to suppress their emotions a lot. I mean, I see this in the UK all the time with Theresa May, and it is a big problem. Whereas in New Zealand, we had a prime minister who showed her, you know, sorrow, her emotions. We tend to think that emotions are a sign of weakness, not at all, just the opposite. Only people who are confident enough will show their, their moments of anxiety, share that openly. Emotions are, are a source of, can be a source of strength. Compassion is a very strong element, is a very strong energy. So in a nutshell, mm. I think um, her response to a very dramatic, very big atrocity was, was very wise. Viewed one way, I guess, the only thing that matters in life is Emotion. I mean, if it wasn't for emotions, if no one felt anything, none of this would matter anyway. That is right? so true. That, that is what makes us human, right? <laughs> that's, that's And that's what, how we remember the past, mostly uh, through emotions. At, at one level, everything else is in service to that. We think of emotions as fleeting and lightweight, but 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 there are deep emotions. That is what our whole lives are about. They're like deep joy, happiness, like mm -hmm. for, yearning for yeah. whatever, whatever we might yearn yeah. for. The, When I when I you know read um, people who have survived the worst atrocities in in human history, including the of course Holocaust, genocides, there's one thing that draws my attention, and that is they talk a lot about how the opposite of goodness is not necessarily evil or wickedness. Of course, there are people who are evil, but relatively fewer in numbers. Bad things happen not because there are so many evil people out there. So the survivors are telling us that bad things happen when numbness mm. settles in, you know, when we become desensitized, when we become numb, indifferent to the pain of other, to the stories of other. And I think in that regard as well, it's important to revive our emotions, to be passionate about politics, to be passionate about humanity, but to try to channel those emotions in a constructive way. Mm. Elif, can I ask you um, for a minute about your personal life? Yes. Um, in your last TED Talk, you had this extraordinary moment where you reveal for the first time in public uh, that you were bisexual. That's right. Um, you're married, you live in London, you commute back, or do you commute now, you, back to Istanbul, or is, or is it too dangerous for you to Nowadays, go back there? Nowadays, less so. Nowadays, less so. yeah. I mean, your, your whole life is full of embracing what some people would view as contradictions. Can you, can you talk about your personal life? 
Well, the, it was it was very hard for me um, in a way. The reason I'm saying this because my recent TED talk, to me at least, it was like a manifesto for multiplicity, uh, in which I wanted to defend having multiple belongings, multiple voices, and I mentioned for the first time in a public space that I was bisexual. When you look at my work, I think this has always been an important element in my in my writing. Um, I have stayed in women's studies, gender studies for for a long time in academia. I, I taught these classes. I taught queer studies as well. So all of that was an important part of my work. In all my interviews, my activism, I have defended the rights of sexual minorities. And of, obviously it's in my fiction as well, always very important in, in many of my novels. However, I had never said, I had never had the courage to come into a public space and say, by the way, this is also who I am. Um, because I was so worried about the backlash that I would receive from my motherland. And to me, to be able to give this talk was incredibly important. Afterwards, I had beautiful feedback uh, response from so many people all over the world. But I'm very sad to say, from Turkey, I had a horrific backlash. And so for days, weeks, it went on for about um, three weeks. I'm not exaggerating. You know, every day I would receive these, you know, things that were written in the press, um, columnists, social media, newspapers, TV programs, Islamist newspapers calling me pervert, um, very nasty uh, tweets on social media trying to teach me a lesson as a woman. And I think for women, it's it's much harder in, in such circumstances. So that went on for a long time. But I was ready to deal with it. You know, I wish I had the courage to come forward and say, I am bisexual. You know, this is who I am. Um, I wish I could have done that a decade ago. I couldn't, but I did it when I felt ready. Where I come from, it is not easy to talk about these subjects. Yet we must, but when we feel ready. Mm. Do you see any trajectory where Islam mm -hmm. and mainstream Muslims would find it easier to speak openly about gay marriage, gay relationships? Is there any trajectory where that can happen? It's, it's quite tough because um, the public space is mostly dominated by more orthodox voices. But that doesn't mean that that is the only voice that exists across Muslim cultures. Muslim cultures have been always incredibly diverse all throughout history. Just a small anecdote. Um, around the time I was six, seven years old, that is when my parents officially divorced. They were separated, but you know, they, they got officially divorced. And I spent that summer partly with my maternal grandmother and partly with my paternal grandmother. And these two women were at the first glance very similar, both of them Turkish, Sunni, Muslim, middle class, right? Very, very similar. And yet their interpretation of Islam couldn't have been more different. So in the house of my paternal grandmother in Izmir, God was regarded as a transcendental being, patriarchal being, always watching like a celestial gaze that mm. never blinked even, always watching you. And it was always about haram and halal, you know, sins. If you don't sit up properly, you are committing a haram. You know, always that teaching of fear. Her notion of Islam revolved around fear. Mm. And I remember coming back from her house so traumatized that I couldn't go to the bathroom because, you know, it was very scary for me that God was always watching me. And when I say this to my maternal grandmother, she laughed. She said, honey, I'm sure God has more important things to do than, you know. <sighs> and then there was lightness in her approach. There was humor. There was love at the center of her interpretation. So all I'm saying is, if even my two grandmothers can be so different, how can we think that the entire Muslim world is just one voice? There's a huge diversity there. The problem, unfortunately, is that orthodox, patriarchal interpretations dominate the mm. mainstream public space. And even within you, that, that there's, I mean, Islam 
plays some kind of role. I mean, talk about Su- Sufism, the mystical yeah. side of Islam. Well, I'm I'm drawn to mysticism in general. So I love reading about Jewish mysticism just as much as I like uh, reading about Sufism. I love reading about Christian mysticism. So I like mystics in general. But as I said, I am not a believer myself. You know, I have too many doubts. I don't like religions, the way they shape our lives and divide us. None of that speaks to my heart. But there is something in spirituality and mysticism and faith in general that I take seriously and I like to think about harder. And many of those mystics, I think if you brought them together around the same table, like Isaac Luria, Abu Lafia, Teresa de Avila or Meister Eckhart or Rumi and Shams of Tabriz, I really honestly think these people would break bread together. Hmm. They would have a wonderful meal together. They said very similar things, even though they lived in completely different places, centuries, but the quest was very similar. And that quest was very inner-oriented. They focused on the inner meaning of the text rather than fear. And most of them defended love and empathy and connectivity. And it breaks my heart that that old philosophy has to a large extent been forgotten, erased or censored across the Middle East. There's a part of me that wants to say, particularly to young people, remember this philosophy existed. I don't want to romanticize Sufi groups today because many of them can be just as patriarchal, just as hierarchical as the rest of the society. And I don't like to over-romanticize anything. But rather than looking at individual people, remembering the old philosophies of Spinoza, of Rumi, of Shams of Tabriz, There's a beauty there that we have forgotten. And to me, what is remarkable is these people try to understand God. Whereas today we're far more obsessed with religion than the idea or the possibility of God. That is a very interesting shift that happened in the modern times. Elif, bringing to us some of the wisdom of the mystics um, seems like a beautiful way to wrap this up. Thank you so much for what you stand for and for the just the nuance the richness the the many many sometimes contradictory truths you bring together and and hold and share with us it's been a real treat to talk with you it's been such a pleasure thank you thank you Alif okay that's a wrap for this episode If you think Alif's wisdom could be relevant for anyone in your life, please consider sharing it with them. You could also write a brief review of the TED interview on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Those reviews are influential, actually. We certainly read every word. This show was produced by Sharon Mashihi. Our editorial director is Michelle Quint, production manager Roxanne Highlash. Mix engineer is David Herman, and our theme music is by Alison Leighton-Brown. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, Michael Tubbs. When he became mayor of Stockton, California, at the age of 26, he understood that he needed to tackle the roots of the city's crime and poverty. We have to be reminded of what's good about who we are as Americans. And what's good about us is we don't always get it right but we always find a way to start to correct it. Hello there, it's Chris Anderson here, and I have a special message for you. A lot of people don't know this, but TED is a non-profit. Uh, we're not here to make any shareholders rich. We're here because... We have this mission that we all believe in to share ideas freely with the world, ideas that matter. Now, I'll be straight with you. The pandemic has been challenging for TED. Our conference revenues have dried up, of course, and they were the source of our ability to share ideas freely with the world. So for the first time, we're turning to you, our listeners, for support. But we want to do so in a way that's not just asking for money, but it's actually also offer you something really special. Today, I want to invite you to become a founding member of a new community at TED. This will be an online community devoted to a desire to build a better future, 
And I'd love you to be part of it. We're recommending people pay $5 a month, but you can actually pay whatever you want. We don't want anyone not to be part of this because they can't afford it. And as a member, you will get special programming, programming that we've actually never done before and never offered to anyone. We'll be looking for your advice on how to take TED forward. And you'll have a chance to connect with each other, to other people who share your values. So it's a big dream, and I'd really love you to be part of it. If you like this podcast, if you value what we've given you, I really hope you can join us. So to sign up and take a peek at future events, visit ted.com slash membership. That's ted.com slash membership.